We do have someone from Wake Forest, so a lot of good academics over at Wake Forest. We've been looking forward to this. Our own Corey Swanson, our president and CEO, has a real interest in this area. And uh, since we determined that we have a specialist at Wake Forest in, in the issue of central banking, we decided to ask Professor John Wood to come by and talk to us a bit. Uh, he says that central bankers, like the rest of us, respond to interests and information which have depended on their proximity to the public. In this presentation today, Professor Wood is going to be talking with us about examples of the behavior of central banks in Britain and the U.S. in the 19th to 21st centuries. His goal is to illustrate the relations between their policies and their political positions. Professor Wood is a professor of economics at Wake Forest. He teaches topics in macroeconomics, financial markets, monetary theory. He's a prolific researcher, author, and a reviewer as well. Please welcome Professor John Wood. We're going to do a wardrobe change here. Thanks, Donna. Well, hello. I don't have an opening joke. Uh, I'm interested in central banking. My understanding of, of a democracy is very simple in this case. I mean, many, many definitions of democracy. That is, those who are influenced by policy might have some influence on it. Uh, and when I talk about policy, I want to refer to the poverty of the theory of economic policy. I, I teach every economist loves the courses in micro. Remember micro? You took, took micro. Individuals and firms maximize their position subject to the constraints to which they're subject. I love that. I thought that was economics. <laughs> uh, but in public policy, when it gets to public policy, what do the public policy people do? They do what they're told, right? You have this model of the household, you have this model of the firm. When, when it comes to behavior by Congress or an agency or whatever, they have an assignment and they do it. Right. Well, why? Why should they do it? Don't they respond? Are, are they not like Shylock? Are they not like human? Like anyone else? Um, so this, this is what I refer to the poverty of, of, of the economic policy. Now, public choice you think of James Buchanan, people like that, it's a major field, it's an interesting field. Very interesting, potentially useful, but it doesn't somehow get into the macro or the monetary textbook. It's a separate topic. We have these regulations because they're needed. I mean, that's the introduction to a discussion of, uh, of bank regulation. And I don't have a th general theory of, of uh, central bank behavior. It depends on time, circumstances. Probably wouldn't be able to anyway. But we'll give some examples. Presumably, these guys behave differently in different circumstances, different political, institutional circumstances. And we've had a lot of different circumstances that central bankers have had to deal with over the years. Now, when I say a central bank, what's a central bank? I'll just define the central bank. It's, if I had a picture, I should have had this picture. It's a printing press. The Fed is not a bank. <laughs> It doesn't borrow and lend and make money on the difference. If, if before the days of the computer, I would have a printing press in my basement, and then I'd buy, go and buy a government bond. Uh, that's how the money supply has increased. That's how they can do it quicker now with the, with the computer. So uh, basically, it, it's a it's a it's a printing press. And how fast do they print the money is, is a question. Okay, the first example is the Great Depression. Uh, I just picked up a couple of pictures. I Google, so forth, and uh, this is a bread line, of course, and a donut line, whatever. And this is a guy selling his farm mortgages, uh, and a couple of quotations: Congressman Sabbath, uh, the money supply and income fell about one third. If, if you took all the depressions in the history of the United States, each one of them had a hold. You would fill those up, all the dirt from filling those up wouldn't fill the, the Great Depression. I mean, the, the thing that just happened is not, 
It may compare with 73, but it's not like the Great Depression. The money supply fell tremendously. Banks failed. Prices failed. People ran to the banks. They took the money out of the banks. Large parts of the country were on barter. Okay. Uh, Congress was upset. Actually, the House of Representatives passed several bills to get the Fed or by some other agency to increase money, increase the quantity of money. They missed the quantity of money. The, the, these were all killed in the Senate. People complained about the Fed, but the Fed was pretty much left alone. And when Sabbath would have been on a committee talking to uh, representatives of the Fed, and the Fed, we, we can only do things. Isn't this an emergency? The uh, quotation I like is, uh, in 1932, a House committee was interviewing Harrison, President Harrison of the New York Fed. I like this name, Congressman Thomas Jefferson Busby of Mississippi. I do not know whether you know it or not, but about one-fourth of the homes in my state have been sold for taxes during the present month. 60,000 homes, 7 million acres of land. Okay, thanks for very good. President Harrison said, but if, but if we start doing things now, it's going to mess up the bond market. Uh, now, th this kind of tells you where, where his concerns lay. Uh, the Federal Reserve was formed, okay, in 1913, you have these governors appointed by the president and these Federal Reserve Bank people. They're, it was designed by the big banks for the big banks. So when people wonder about why they bailed them out in 08, well, I mean, that's, what, they're, that's what, what they were for. The original idea at the top of the act said, we want an elastic currency. We don't want any more financial panics and so forth. And of course, what we then get is the worst, is the worst we've ever had. Uh, the Federal Reserve never did do anything during the Great Depression. We, came out of it, Roosevelt's devaluation. Uh, but the Fed had some assignments, okay? An elastic currency, but they also had gold reserve ratios. One of their assignments was to maintain the gold standard. Of course, we had a tremendous inflation during World War I, and prices never did come up. Prices were going to have to come down sometime. I don't think they realized that. Some people still don't realize you had to have an inflation. Possibly, but, but, but the Fed couldn't increase the money supply beyond some multiple of their gold reserves. Now, they had excess reserves, but you can never be too careful. If you start inflating, they were worried about inflation. Anyway, they didn't take steps to, to, combat, uh, to combat the depression. They were worried about their gold reserve ratios among, anyway, what was the cost to them? When you talk about economic incentives, remember, it's not an incentive unless its failure is painful, right? I mean, if you make a decision, you don't fix your car, or you order the wrong meal or whatever, or spend, overspend or whatever, you suffer. There's all these guys suffer. Not that they're not well-intentioned. Uh, people. Now, l let me give you another example. Uh, and when, when I talk about central banks and other people and so forth, it's, it's, it's not that they always make mistakes, whatever. But, but between Andrew Jackson, remember Andrew Jackson killed the Bank of the United States between about 1832 or 3 and 1913, there was no central bank. Right. Under a commodity standard, under the gold standard, you don't need a cent. The money supply is determined in a free market. You dig it out of the ground. I mean, uh, it's not an accident that the South African stuff and, and the Alaskan gold rush came, came toward the end of a declining price level when gold became more valuable. Uh, the money supply was determined, not always the way we like it, but you don't need a central bank. It might be useful. It might be troublesome. 
but the 19th century really, the central bank, the, the chief monetary authority was the House of Representatives. And uh, they had close relations, always controversial. I mean, some guys wanted more money, some guys wanted less uh, in the 19th century. But co okay, comes the Civil War. Comes the Civil War. We don't have enough. We didn't really have any ability to pay for it. So in 1861, we suspended convertibility. We took a Chapter 11, the government. In, in wartime, you don't have enough gold to finance the war effort. So you say, well, you got the dollars, you keep them. These are the greenbacks. We'll, 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 uh, we'll redeem them sometime, maybe. Uh, well, they did in this, in this case. Mostly when go governments do that, they don't do it. OK, so, uh, so you can see the top line is that the money stock, usually defined, doubled. Uh, during the Civil War. You see it going up then. Uh, gold, the dollar value of gold, it took more dollars to buy gold. This is during the war. On the left side there, this is what happened during the war. The price level went up, the money supply went up. Okay, now comes 1864. Okay, now we're going to talk about monetary policy. Comes 1864, the war is over. They thought, you know, not everybody knew that yet, but the, the House passed. <laughs> The, the House passed a bill. We want to get back with sound money. The dollar, it now takes, how many dollars? It took, it takes a dollar and a half compared to a former dollar to buy an ounce of gold. We want to return to the gold standard at the pre-war exchange rate. Because remember, you bought bonds, you saved money in 1850. You have dollars, you have claims on dollars. You want to restore the gold value. It's a controversial point. There was a Greenback Party, you might remember. Some people wanted to return. Some people weren't so anxious about it. Anyway, by about 144 to 6 in uh, 1864, the House voted that the Secretary of the Treasury should redeem the Greenbacks as rapidly as the business of the country would allow. Let's get back. Well, he started to do that, and what he started getting letters. How would you like? Okay, so we had inflation. Prices are now double. Lots of people didn't know I mean, what's going to be the future price. You, you just entered into a contract in 1863. What, what's the future value of the dollar going to be? What's the future of the gold standard? Maybe, and lots of people would say, let's just keep the dollar at the value it is now. Let's not go through this deflation. That's always an argument. But the sound money guys said, we're going to go through this deflation. We're going to restore the gold standard at its old value. They got, they got all these letters from people. And uh, the, the, now to the creditors, the people who have to pay dollars don't want a more expensive dollar. Maybe if you're a lender, you don't want all your creditors to go bankrupt. So Congress was deluged by letters. A bunch of Thomas Jefferson Busbys. And Congress said, oh, maybe we acted too soon. They repealed the law. It took us till 1879. This is the longest successful resumption ever. Notice the, uh, the fall in the price of gold took until 1870. We never did retire the greenbacks. MV equals PT, the country grew into the greenbacks. Now, that's an example of, I don't know, it's, it's biased. Congress does a lot of screwy things, too. But this was, this was the case in which the public had some, apparently some influence on monetary policy. Uh, OK, now. The crisis of 1847. This, uh, this is the best picture I could get from Google. Uh, Google, England, the Bank of England. The Bank of England was a private institution with special privileges. It was founded in 1694 <laughs> because the government needed money. We'll give you a monopoly of banking in London if you lend us a million two hundred thousand dollars for for a price. See, the government was fighting. <coughs> they were fighting Louis the Fourteenth. We need some money. Nobody would lend them any money. 
And money by money, I mean gold to pay the troops in Europe. So the Bank of England was found, it's a private institution subject to control with directors and so forth. It had public responsibilities. You can almost say pseudo public, but they were interested in making a profit. But the difference between them and the Fed is that the, 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 their situation depends on that of the public. If you're a bank, if you're a private institution, you don't want your customers to go bankrupt, for example. I mean, people don't always do the right thing. The Fed's position is okay. Not that they don't care in some sense, like you and I care about the people in Ethiopia. Uh, but there's no real call for them to do anything. Okay, now the Bank of England, like central banks generally, was badly behaved. Historic, whatever the central bank, good, bad, or whatever, they exacerbate economic fluctuations. They don't stabilize. Uh, when, when a boom happens, the South, Latin, South American colonies, now they get their freedom and these are good places to invest. There's a South American boom. Or maybe this is a railway boom. Uh, uh, you know, the South Sea bubble, you know, 1720, they had these. Things. What usually happens is central banks join it. They pump in money themselves. Uh, they lose gold, people, the, 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 uh, you start having a price increase, your exports fall. You lose gold. Well, Parliament passed the Bank Act of 1844 was an attempt to control the Bank of England. We're going to try, we're going to tie, sorry, we're going to tie your lending to your gold. If gold comes in, you can expand because you have good gold reserve ratio. If you leave gold, you must contract your lending. Well, the Bank of England's gold was falling. And with banks, you know, if you think it's going to be in trouble, it's going to be in trouble, right? Uh, the Bank of England came close to uh, suspension. We're going to run out of, we're running up against our reserve requirement, we're going to run out of cash. Now, the original history of central banking was that money is not a macroeconomic tool. The function of the central bank was to maintain the money supply, to maintain the payment system. So, so that you pay, you, know, you pay guys on the basis of payments you're expected to receive today, you're going to pay tomorrow. The whole system is like that. And you twitch it a little bit and, and things can break down. You know, when you're, when you're traveling on the interstate, you, you run into a... Uh, Long line of traffic, right? Wonder, what the hell am I going to do? I'll pull off, sit in line, so forth. Eventually, it starts to move. You don't see any cause. You know, you know just, a, just a few cars, just a little change can, can interrupt the flow of cash, and people depend on that cash. Pe people think, as I said, if, if, if people complain about capitalists and these money guys and so forth. Well, if you don't meet, meet a payment, you're bankrupt. That's news, right? I mean, these guys have to, when's the last time your doctor was on time? Uh, and the function of a central bank used to be to make sure, to be the, this lender of last resort was not bailing, it was to make sure that the money supply. Anyway, uh, in, in economics, you know, if you think there's going to be a shortage, there's going to be a shortage. Uh, uh, so people were, were uh, the money supply was falling. There were rumors, it looked as though cash was going to be hard to come by. So what happens then? Hoarding. So you pay as late as possible. You know, it increases the problem. People were failing. They appealed to Parliament a bunch of times. Uh, and finally, Parliament and the Bank of England said, okay, the rule is out. The Bank, the, the, the bank of uh, England can print as much money as it wants so you can carry on your business even though there's no gold. Now, you might say this is not good for long-run behavior, but it was a response to a problem at the time. 
in fact, and uh, as you know, in England, they really don't, really don't have the rule of law in a, in a way. If, if you have the majority of party, the majority party, you can promise illegal things, which can then be legalized later. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, the uh, <coughs> chancellor and the governor said, the bank of can print this money, and the panic stopped. They didn't actually need it. Once they knew it was available, they stopped rushing for it. This, this was a response. You know, the, the, now, now, why was this? was this? Was it because Parliament was smart? The Bank of England was smart? Uh, they were certainly more closely attuned to the health of the financial sector than uh, the Federal Reserve was. And don't forget, these guys were in London, comparative to New York. So this is a, this is a, a, a different institution, a different response. Okay, this is another one. I'll go through this. This is the famous picture, uh, probably the most famous monetary picture. This is the original, you can't see it very well. That's Pitt molesting the old lady of Threadneedle Street. When, when the Bank of England was founded, people were worried about the government's use of the bank to evade the democratic process. Uh, right when uh, our, our taxes are less than our uh, revenue, right? How, how the hell do they expect to meet these programs? Well, they're going to borrow. And hopefully, the central bank will help along those lines. They can borrow without raising the rate of interest. The central bank has a function. They knew that there was this, this problem. And in, in the Bank of England's original charter, just like Alexander Hamilton's when he wrote the, the charter for the Bank of the United States, the amount which they could lend to Parliament was limited. Parliament would have to pass an act. They'd have to be open about their borrowing for the Bank of England which of course they violated, including Pitt. Okay, so now they're fighting France. And uh, Pitt is <laughs> taking cash from the old lady of Threadneedle Street. And the Bank of England actually, uh, people knew this. Actually, they had records, I guess, general news. The bank was unable to pay money. The Bank of England suspended. The Bank of England suspended in 1797. So, the Bank of England's suspension of payments in 1797 while they were fighting France is like the U.S. in the Civil War. So they didn't want convertibility to interfere with the war effort. So now when the war is over, they decide to uh, go back to the old exchange rate, just like we did the decision in 1864, and it was equally controversial. And notice they didn't really get around to it until 1820 because the Bank of England wouldn't carry through. The Parliament kept saying, come on, come on. Uh, make the pound what it used to be worth. Well, they didn't want to tighten. Every time they started to tighten up, uh, people would scream. Their customers would scream. They would let up. This time, by God, we're going to do it. And the bank is complaining. The parliamentary committee said, you're going to restore the pound to its gold value in steps. I, I don't want to criticize Ricardo, but I can criticize Ricardo. I must be, I must be wrong. But uh, and people in, in these, a lot of these economic models, they move smoothly along curves and so forth. But you know, like, if I say the, pr the price of this stock is going to be, it's 10 now, but it, it's going to be 12 tomorrow, it's immediately going to be 12. <laughs> you're, you're not going to, you're, like when they used to adjust exchange rates, right? you remember this, will adjust exchange rates to new equal, God, it happens immediately if people expect it. And, and uh, but anyway, the Bank of England wanted discretion. 
all central bankers, good, bad, whatever, want discretion for, for whatever purpose. But, but Parliament laid out this rule for resumption. If the directors of the bank have a true comprehension of the views of the committees in submitting this scheme to Parliament, they are obliged to infer that the object of the committees, the parliamentary, is to secure at every hazard, no matter the uncertainty, and under every possible variation of circumstances, the return of payments in gold at mint price for banknotes at the expiration of two years. Well, who the hell knows what's going to happen the next two years? Uh, we can't do that. But they were made to do it, and they did it, and, and there, was, there, there was a depression at the time. Uh, it, it is said that Ricardo recanted on his deathbed, but I don't, he didn't. He thought the Bank of England screwed it up. Uh, he was, now, okay, here, here's a good, nobody remembers, I'm, I'm sort of been reading about Lord Liverpool. He was Prime Minister of England longer than anybody else. Everybody knows Disraeli and Gladstone, not Lord Liverpool. He was the kind of a guy that, that people could get along with. He could organize a government. Anyway, he was the prime minister from uh, 1812 to 1827. The economics was sort of his era. But after this depression, the one I just talked about, the Bank of England, there was a, a boom. Uh, and uh, here's what Liverpool said. It's the opposite of the Greenspan put. Uh, this, is a, this is what's enhanced. The peril not only the individual but the whole country from the blind indulgence of this craving for sudden wealth. He commented, commented on that general spirit of speculation which was going beyond all bounds and was likely to bring the greatest mischief on numerous individuals. He urged them to reflect what would be the situation of the public if an embarrassing event were to occur? Their lordships would recollect that when commercial embarrassment, when the Bank of England got into trouble in 1805 or 1810, they were helped out because they were financing the war. Now there's no war. We don't need these special. You're supposed to behave yourself. During the late war, bankers and merchants come forward and apply for parliament, which they obtained by issues. He wished it, however, to be clearly understood that those persons who now engaged in joint stock companies or other enterprises entered on those speculations at their peril and risk. He thought it his duty to declare that he would never in, in advise the introduction of any bill for their relief. On the contrary, if such a measure were proposed, he would oppose it, and he hoped that parliament would resist any measure of that kind. In fact, it did happen. There was a run on the Bank of England. Bank, what are we going to do? And they post a note on your board. If you run out of cash, we're out of cash. Too bad. Uh, now, not that, not that Parliament, like Congress, doesn't make bad decisions often, but on occasion, you, you don't have to, prom to promise that we'll bail you out. And Liverpool, the government was as good as its word that time. Uh, now, let, let me take the Bank of England, uh, another interesting, oh no, Th this, is, this is the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives would have monetary fights. What, what should the Treasury do? Like, uh, it was a kind of a crazy system. The amount of gold in the country would depend upon the budget and so forth, and maybe we needed some money. The Treasury would invent ways of paying money early or not. Or, and then there were the silver interests. A lot of silver states come into the Union, uh, 1880s and so forth. And uh, these silver interests, people don't quite understand. It's not that they wanted silver money. They wanted an above market price for their silver, because silver was falling rapidly. Uh, but here's William Jennings Bryan, of course, wanted, wanting more silver money. I don't know why I have McKinley. I should really should have Cleveland. Cleveland was when they repealed the Sur Silver Purchase Act, but Cleveland was a representative of sound money guy. And John Sherman was uh, chairman of the uh, House Banking Committee. And he's apologizing for the Silver Purchase Act. They pump a bunch of money in there, and he said, well, yeah, it was a recession, depression. You were happy to receive it at the time. Now what people are doing, the government now is buying 
silver. So people would sell their silver for the dollars and use the dollars to buy the gold. Uh, so we were losing gold and foreigners were taking their gold out of the country. So they repealed, repealed the act. But this is an example of uh, the active role that the House of Representatives took in. Uh, so when I tell my wife, what's your plan for the, if you guys have to give Congress, you mean you're, you're going to give Congress power to control the money? Supply? I said, I don't know, it's, uh, at least it's closer to those who are responsible, maybe, but they're not very responsible. Uh, okay, now let's go to England in the 20s. It's again, like the Civil War period. This is, this is young, 40-year-old Keynes. This is Montagu Norman, governor of the Bank of England. And this is, when, of course, Winston Churchill, chancellor of the Exchequer. Economics was not his thing. How did he end up uh, as Chancellor of the Exchequer in 1924? But England pumped a lot of money to finance World War II. They did what they did, fighting Napoleon. And uh, now it's 1918, and they have a state. We want to restore. We want to restore the gold standard in all of its glory. And you could say that it was an attempt to restore pre-1914 England, which is a great period. But they've had previous tendencies. Now, the Bank of England essentially became a public institution during World War I. It, did not, it was not nationalized formally until labor came in in 45 or 46. Uh, but it was so essential to the war effort, there was some difficulties and so forth, that essentially, it depends on personalities. You might be a dependent institution, but if you're a tough guy, you can still get your way. But for many, many years, well, the prime minister meets the queen every week, right? Has a discussion. The governor of the Bank of England has a meeting with the chancellor of the exchequer every week. From 1931 to 1997, the uh, bank rate, the Bank of England's lending rate, was the chancellor's decision. Now, the bank may be very important in reaching that decision, but, but and remember, this idea of an independent central bank, I mean, are, are we unique? Maybe Germany, does they sort of have an independent central bank? In most countries, uh, you're subject to the legislature from day to day. Uh, and, and, and the governor reports to the chancellor. But doesn't mean that the governor may not have a lot of power. I mean, if, remember, should we have more or less inflation? This is a political issue. You can have a public fight between the governor. You know, Harold Wilson let the Bank of England uh, uh, dictate to him sometimes. He finally got his own way. But anyway, Churchill was Chancellor of the Exchequer from 1914 to 1929. They decided they wanted to return. And in those days, the pound, let's see, I'll put it up here, I think. The historic value of the pound is $4.86. It's 486 uh, from, you know, from the founding of this country until World War I. The exchange rate was 486, and uh, they suspended convertibility during the war. 1918, they decided to restore, and this on this occasion, the Bank of England now being uh, what, what did they want? What did Norman want? You now have in the old days, the governor of the Bank of England, you'd, you'd have uh, 24 directors. They take terms being. Uh, governor. You'd be governor for a year, you'd usually repeat yourself, and then you go back work full-time for your firm. These were local, these were merchant bankers who part-time ran the Bank of England. They were involved in the uh, business of the country. Now, beginning with Monica Norman, 1920, he was governor from 1920 to 1944, and he led the way in resumption. By God, we want, we want London to restore its old position. London's the world's center, hopefully, center 
of finance. And unless the pound, unless the pound maintains its, its strength, we're going to lose that. It turns out that it's irrelevant because London is so important as a pound. It's, it's their expertise, not the value of the pound. There are more yen traded in London than there are pounds. But the Bank of England took the lead in the restoration. And Churchill took the political flack. This is one of his great losses in time. And the first statement is, in, in, in our opinion, is it imperative that after the war we return to the gold standard? And people complain, businessmen, it's basically complain. We don't want this deflation. And this is the point when Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. It's a great thing. MV equals PT. Remember that? MV equals PT. Money is neutral. If you want prices to fall, look, the pound is undervalued. So we want to increase the value of the pound by cutting our prices, right? We'll just have some deflation. M equals PT, you cut M in half, P is cut in half, we can carry on our business with, as if nothing. No. Keynes said, maybe, maybe if after the Civil War you had done this, things would be okay now. In the long run, a monetary restriction is not going to have any effect, but in the long run, we're all dead. It was this action that Keynes, uh, uh, criticized. And the complaints, Mormon said, the Macmillan Committee looked into this in 1930. We should think that high bank rate, inter it's a, in fact, as a rule, was greatly exaggerated. They're much more psychological than real. Uh, and Keynes talked about uh, if you cut back the money supply, all hell is going. So when people ever say, we're going to stop inflation, we're going to cut down inflation, Arthur Burns was surprised. You cut down on inflation. And then they complain when, when, the, when the machinery of the country falls apart. A lot of bets have been made. A lot of decisions have been made on the basis of an expected rise in prices. And if you stop that, uh, there's going to be a lot of disappointment, and Keynes pointed that out. And this, this was a case in which the Bank of England behaved very differently from an earlier Bank of England. Now, it may, the fact that they are now a government, a, a separate, a remote government agent, I've, I've, I guess I've picked, when you're looking for examples, I'm, I'm not denying bias. Uh, this is a, a somewhat different behavior of the Bank of England in the 1920s. Uh, what would I have? I'll, I'll do a couple of. I'll quit here in a minute. Well, oh, I'll just have a pick. I, I like the the, 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 main, the main purpose of the bank, I'm pretty sure over time, has been to monetize the debt. And that's more of a political science question than an economic question. Uh, in previous, you, the idea of taxation is you, there's some things that you want, I'm not a liberal, I don't know what I am, but it, there's some things that, gov that you want government to do, and, and you're going to pay for them, right? <laughs> Through your taxes, you're going to tax yourself in order to enable government to do what you think it should do. But what if the people in charge want to do more than that? And, and you can't get an increase in a vote for the war on poverty or for Vietnam. Well, maybe if you can get the central bank to make up the difference. In other words, you're circumventing the populace when I say it's a political uh, question. Now, Andrew Jackson, probably the bank that I said, could not have survived Andy, no matter what. <laughs> but this is the government's debt, federal debt in millions of dollars. I don't have GNP during that period. Uh, of course, you see that big down where Je Jefferson, you know, Jefferson didn't like to spend money, right? The first act, the, the, fir the first paragraph of his initial State of the Union message was to get rid of the excise tax. So Jefferson saved money. Then the increase was what? War of 1812. 
and then it fell. And then Jackson didn't spend any money. And at the end of Jackson's term, the deficit was, uh, the debt was zero. Then I guess we have, there's the Depression of 1837, then the Mexican War. Uh, so that even apart from Jackson, you really don't need the bank, right? Congress, what was, there were two political parties in uh, 1832, Jackson and everybody, and, <laughs> and his opponents. And they were trying to embarrass Jackson and Congress passed, they, they renewed the bank's charter before the election as a challenge to Jackson. And he vetoed the, uh, the bill. But uh, even apart from that, the support of the bank would have been less because the debt was less. We don't need a central bank if we don't have a debt. Uh, that's, I, I guess I better stop there and ask if there are any questions about it. Without a central bank, how do you control the mint? Yeah, you know, the, uh, like, what would you do now? Uh, under, under the commodity standard, you don't need a central bank. The uh, price level is determined by the relative cost of producing gold and other goods. But once you kill, the Fed killed the central bank, kill, killed the gold standard, right? Uh, the gold standard really was... Some say Nixon, but it, it really happened in 1933. Once you uh, devalue once, you know it's not going to let get in your trouble, in your way again. Uh, so w once you do away with the gold standard, how's the money supply going to be determined? And uh, uh, well. Person, I would just shut down <laughs> and see what happened, but not really, not really because, uh, in general, as a reformer, I'm not a reformer. I just, as I tell myself, I don't want anything to change because I'm okay. Uh, and uh, you, you can have a new idea, Friedman or other people can have a new idea which sounds good, but changes from, and, and it, the change won't be what you expect. So uh, ba basically, without the gold stand, you uh, the, the government has to print money. Unless you could stop, you could reintroduce the gold stand. My own plan would be to deregulate banks, of course. I mean, for a lot of reasons. And then, suppose people like gold. Suppose you want to make gold money. And what's gold? We don't know what the exchange rate. These examples I have here, they went back to a particular exchange rate because they knew what it was. But that we're not, we're not going to go back to $35 an ounce, are we? Because that could be determined in the marketplace. But uh, uh, yeah, the money supply has, has to be determined, and if you don't turn it over to the market, the government has to do it. And they can make money worth it because I'll accept it in payment of taxes and so forth. W once you get rid of the gold standard, you... So, and, and when Ron Paul, on, on related to that, if he wants to return to the gold standard, I haven't read, actually. You have, there's a whole bundle of stuff that has to go with returning to the gold standard. You can't run deficits. You can't make unlimited promises. You can't, you can't promise Social Security maker. You know, these unlimited promises can be made with a paper standard because we can print paper, but they can't be made under the gold standard. Yeah. Other question or comment? Um, I have one professor at Wesleyan who is a professor. We often hear people say we need to audit the Fed. What does that mean? Do you know Walker, Walker Todd? He's a, he's a friend of mine. Well, what's the audit? <laughs> I think, I don't know what that means because 
we know everything it does. Every bond it buys, it's, it is true, I guess maybe, maybe they don't have the gold they say they have in Port Knox, but that's not the Fed. You can look at the Fed's balance sheet, and it's tip, usually it's very simple. These are government bonds. It has, it has, and it has debt in Fed currency. Uh, they make enormous amounts of money. You know the Fed, I, I print a dollar and I buy a bond. I own the bond, so I earn interest on the bond. So the Fed makes a lot of money, most of which it gives back to the Treasury. And I suppose maybe it wastes some. They have nice buildings. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, controlling the Fed, tell us what you're going to do. They have these rules. So, but you know, people in the financial markets, like I'm going to say, what, what's your spread on Security X going to be for the next three weeks, six weeks? Well, I don't know. Uh, and to ask the Fed to tell us what to go is kind of like, so I don't blame them for not. So I don't, it just sounds to me like an embarrassment. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll just start with my, I don't know, that's right at the beginning. Uh, we're, we're in a new world now. And, and when we talk about monetary policy, like what the Fed should do under existing interest rates, historically, the, the inflation has resulted from the Fed suppressing interest rates, like during World War II. Suppose, suppose borrowing and lending, buying, uh, producing, and, and consuming are equated at 6%, supply equals demand. If the Fed's willing to lend at four, you, uh, we're going to have inflation because the rate of interest is, they're keeping the rate of interest too. But the rate of interest is so low, and we're not having significant inflation, the only explanation by traditional economics is that depressed expectations. But earnings are high. And on the low interest rate, uh, yeah, I guess the idea would get to people, if you borrow, you'll not only make money on it, you have something, you'll be able to invest. And I guess, I, there may be something else going on there, but if you just go f continuously from plus one to minus one, uh, it lowers the cost of borrowing and ought to encourage. But, but uh, I say that, uh, but I'm, and, and several European countries are doing it. And does it seem to be helping, does it? Oh, <laughs> if you call it by a different name, right. <laughs> a rose is a rose. It's open market operations, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my, yeah. <laughs>